Thank My you. next guests are experts in climate, energy, and sustainable buildings. Jennifer Gordon is the managing editor and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. Uh, Sarah Albatuti is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute. In 2014, Sarah was appointed as a senior advisor to the Egyptian president. We were just discussing this moment ago, focusing on sustainable community development. Really appreciate you both joining us. This has been a one of my, this has been a cool day. I mean, I've been learning a lot about you know blue hydrogen and you know youth activism across the Middle East, like the whole Middle East. Um, let me just start with you, Jennifer. You tweeted. You know, I follow you on Twitter, as you know. And you say, next Thursday, we're going to co-host a first-of-a-kind Model COP26 with our partners, UK and USA and University of Kansas. This is going to allow student negotiators and observers an up-close look into the exciting world of climate diplomacy. I love this kind of climate diplomacy. So what are you, I mean, I know you're talking to these people already, but what do you think their angles are going to be in a climate diplomacy simulation? And is it going to show up the real COP26? Thank you so much, Steve. That's a great question. Um, so we're doing this program this week um, that is kind of, if you think about what Model UN is, right, where you have these teams of students um, who, are, who are young and motivated and interested and engaged. Um, and so we have, we've put together similar teams, but on, on climate. Um, and so each team will have to prepare its own country brief. We have seven countries, I believe, represented um, by these student teams. And we, we, as the Atlantic Council staff, will be the facilitators of, of this conversation, um, and we'll see we'll see what happens if we can reach our um, our our climate goals through through this event on Thursday. That's very interesting. Are you going to send any of them to the real Glasgow uh, uh, meetings? We'll see. I mean, we're hoping we're hoping that we can all go um, by then. Oh, that would be fun, Sarah. Let me let me ask you. One of the things that often gets neglected is the talk about how many emissions in our conservation problem by way of buildings, architecture, the way we design communities. I become fairly obsessed with it because not only have we had the LEED building certification issue in the United States, but now LEED is trying to look at, you know, what does a healthy community look like? What are the different dimensions of that? And environmental impact and, and sustainability are very high on that, on that radar, on that, on that uh, screen for them. So tell us, you're an architect. Um, and I have never thought about the questions about what's going on globally. I've been more obsessed about what's happening in D.C. here in town. But what, what do you think the opportunities and obstacles are in bringing architecture and building management and construction into the climate conversation? Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for, um, for posing this question. So if we look at the overall picture, basically, the reason why we were given an opportunity to plunge into this conversation was because of the Paris Agreement. And one of the pillars of the Paris Agreement discusses housing, which is basically all buildings, anywhere, you know, people spend 90% of their time. And now with COVID, we're spending more time in spaces. And so what people want out of the spaces they occupy is not just engineering excellence, it's a lifestyle and it's being healthy. And it's also providing equity for people living in spaces that are not providing good health. So as architects, it's no longer traditional to just build something that looks good, you know, stays within the budget, and then you, you, you work on the construction site. You're actually rethinking about what these buildings contribute to the health and the lifestyle and the general well-being of those who are in it. Um, so around the world, of course, LEED um, discusses this and you know it has rating systems, but around the world what's happening now is that climate change integration is playing a bigger role in the built environment. And because of that, there are internal and national rating systems that are coming up, which are tailored and made for um, the the climate needs and the wants, you know, on on a on a national level, and that's a very exciting thing to do because it makes green buildings and it makes buildings more accessible and attainable and mm. culturally more um, relevant to to each uh, to each continent in one sense. Let me thank you for that. Let me ask you both um, and try not to to muck this up, but um, you know, I, I actually do invent some questions here, but I want to you know, ask you, one of the things, we were just talking to, to Majid from a company called Bea, and he's got some uh, operations actually in Cairo now, 
But one of the big changes, whether you're looking at carbon sequestration or you're looking at renewables or you're looking at uh, moving from coal to other forms of energy sources, and everyone thinks, okay, that's good. But the growth in India, the growth in China, the growth in you know, certain uh, developing nations, which is very, very rapid. People don't understand how rapid developing nation growth is. Sometimes outstrips supply. It outstrips um, the ability to pay for it. And so there is this um, view that sometimes rich nations can have these debates about climate and renewables. Poor nations cannot. I'm interested from you, both, both uh, uh, Jennifer and Sarah, what are the things we need to put in place to bridge technology, innovation, and development to the developing world so that cost and price and, you know, doesn't become a factor when we're talking about, you know, the global fishbowl. Jennifer? Sure. Thanks, Steve. So, you know, I think that when we tend to think about whether it's in a developing country or, you know, in a developed country, when we think that there's this price differential between something that is you know, a fossil fuel versus something that is cleaner or better for the environment. I want to stress that that's a policy choice. Right. And I think that we need to make sure that we reverse that policy and that we make, you know, that we incentivize the use of the thing that is, in fact, better for the environment. Um, and so, and we need to do that globally. Um, and I think too, that when we think about, you know, if we're sitting in the United States and we think about other places in the world, um, you know, and why should we care? Why should we help decarbonize an energy system on the other side of the world? You know, ultimately when it comes to climate change, I think, you know, we, we sink or swim together. Um, and so we need to make sure that what we do, what we put in place um, in the United States is, you know, that we, we are looking, um, for global solutions to decarbonization worldwide, um, that that's you know every bit as as important. And I know you asked, you had another part of the question. Um, oh, I think you were asking about um, different technologies. Um, yeah. And I think when you look globally at clean energy technology, something that works on you know and, and that's appropriate you know for one grid may be different, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking you know for every for every answer to this problem. And finally, I will say that. I think we need to take an all of the above clean energy approach. So, you know, sometimes that might be carbon capture utilization and storage. Sometimes it might be clean hydrogen. Um, sometimes it might be nuclear reactors. You know, there are a number of different ways of getting to zero. And I think that we need to look at all of them. Sarah, what are your thoughts on how do you bridge uh, that dimension if you think it needs to be bridged? I think it definitely needs to be bridged, but I also think that we shouldn't underestimate um, the wealth of indigenous um, knowledge. And in the Middle East, there are many, many intelligent ways where, you know, from, from our ancestries that have adapted and mitigated risks to their livelihoods, especially the livelihood that is tied to agriculture, the livelihood that is tied to, um, uh, to water resources. And therefore, it would be a very smart way of adapting the technology that is, the, and, and, you know, the West are leaders in this. You know, there's the technologies moving forward, the education systems are, and the awareness uh, is, is, is much, is, is far ahead. However, what we need to do is to make it very accessible and user friendly for the culture. This is the way that we will absorb this. So instead mm. of localizing only what we know, we need to integrate foreign technology, use it here, localize it in our own smart we find solutions that are digestible to society and to culture. Because, you know, there, there's so much that is going on um, that the most important thing, I think, for climate change to really become mainstream is our ability to channel what we know of forecasting. what is going to happen you know with our water resources with our um, increased heat um with our population growth so these are things that we know and now we have to integrate them and how the policy as jennifer was saying the policy has to be one that is current but also one that is continuously mm. working out to adapting these foreign ways of thinking and how we can interpret them here in North Africa, in the Middle East and in Egypt. And this is why the first step is to really look at where the emissions are coming from in terms of the industries 
the agriculture and also the housing sector, which is the fastest growing market. Um, and so it's all about integrating, um, you know, ideas into policy and making it accessible to people that where, where it's fairly new. Look, I, we've only got a minute left and we're going to talk to the Undersecretary General uh, on climate and environment in a moment. Um, but I want to ask you both real quickly. You know, I've talked to, um, I don't know what we call him, Senator Secretary John Kerry a number of times on climate. And he always said that, you know, Copenhagen wasn't enough. Um, we need more, more, more. What would be success and what would be failure, if you could give me short form, uh, in, in Glasgow, uh, both of you? Uh, Jennifer? Um, so I think that every country obviously needs to, um, or we have to up and increase our ambition um, when it comes to climate, when it comes to COP26. Um, and then I think we also really need to have very concrete um, steps in place to getting there. Because it's one thing to say, you know, we're going to be net zero by 2050. Um, or, you know, to make a pledge you know, that is similar to that. Um, but I think, you know, going really sector by sector and saying, this is how we're going to address the electricity sector. This is how we're going to address heavy industry um, and so on and so forth. So that's what I'm hoping to see um, later on this year. Sarah, thank, thank you, Jennifer. Sarah? I'm hoping that definitely this year we are talking more about awareness and, and education and also showing roadmaps, as Jennifer was saying, sector by sector. The other thing is, is to really take the lessons learned from COVID and to understand that we need to push for equality in terms of how we move forward with such important policy um, and to, to create the heroes, to show the project, to really provide a platform in every single sector of the heroes that are doing changes for climate change and really put them out there for people to learn from and to expose these great examples in all of the different sectors, hmm. not just activism, but there's so much that's being done. And I think the whole world needs to hear about it. And the next, the next meeting in Glasgow should be showcasing that anyone can take part in climate change and it should become the norm. I'll make a deal with you both if, you know, around the time that Glasgow is happening, I'd love to have you both back. Um, Sarah, are you in Cairo now? Yes. Amazing. So your foreign minister, Shukri, used to be ambassador from Egypt to Washington, D.C. And years yes. ago, we used to talk about climate. Many, many years ago, climate change would be needed. And I'm just going to put a challenge to Egypt that, that I don't think many people expect what they just heard from you. I don't think they expect a nation with as many challenges as Egypt making positive contributions on the global stage when it comes to climate. It's a great story, and I hope <clears throat> you'll both come back and tell us about it. And if Egypt, you know, like sometimes small countries are the ones that make a difference. So I, I mean, and Egypt is not a small country, of course, but you know, it's an underappreciated country in terms of this. And I really appreciate your thoughts today and would love to have you back. Maybe we can get, you know, for Mr. Shukri to join us. Uh, but thank you so much for, for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.